Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm your host, Rick Bennett. Please consider donating or purchasing a transcript by going to our website, gospeltangents.com shop. You'll help support other documentaries and podcasts such as this. Dr. Darren Smith has written a book about how race, religion, and sport collide at BYU and other institutions. BYU is known to have a large number of students of Polynesian descent and recently hired the first Tongan coach in America, it's Kalani Sitaki. We'll talk about how Darren Smith feels about this hiring, as well as how minorities in general fare at BYU. Let's listen in on our conversation. Tell us about your book. What's the name of your book? And, and tell us what it's about. It's, uh, it's called When Race, Religion, and Sport Collide, um, Blacks at BYU, Blacks, uh, Black Athletes at BYU and Beyond. Uh, it was published by Roman and Littlefield in 2016, uh, toward the end of uh, the year, so around November-ish. So, um, published first on hardback, then later came out on paperback, so it, that's a testament to how well it's doing. So I'm really glad to see because most books like this don't really do well, but sports books actually, there's a market for sports books. So, um, uh, viewers, if you're listening to us, there is a market for, for sports books, particularly when you mix it with religion, which is a very interesting uh, mix, which is what the book is really about. I'm trying to talk about, um, and, and as you mentioned earlier, Rick, you know, I, I'm trying to look at sp sports as an as a industrial complex, the thorny topic of race, and how religion sort of underscores it all. And, 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 I'm, and I'm using BYU as, an, as a lens because I worked there for, for several years and I saw and met and just was witness to several incidences, high profile incidences where athletes were able, athletes were, they came in and they were there for a short time and they were out. And, and generally um, when they left, it was too much fanfare and media attention, um, uh, public scrutiny if you will. And I noticed a pattern of just those young men um, uh, who, are, who seem to have their business, or their business trotted out in the public versus uh, other athletes who you never hear anything about. So that really got me thinking about it. And then, of course, the Brandon Davies thing happened in 2011. You probably remember that. Mm -hmm. And that really tipped the scale for me. I was like, hmm, there's a story here. You know, and so then I was um, worked with a gentleman named Luke O'Brien who was working for a, a media outlet called Deadspin. Uh, in 2011, and so he and I collaborated on, on an article about um, this phenomena of high-profile athletes being kicked out of BYU, and that led to the book When Race, Religion, and Sport Collide. So I did a much more expansive look at that. So, yeah. So I I, I bought it last month. I read the whole thing. It's a great book. Um, so I, I I really encourage everyone to, to to check it out. So one of the things you know. We live here in Utah. We're just down the road, literally from BYU right now, mm -hmm. here in Orem. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, because I think a lot of, a lot of listeners um, probably think that uh, a lot of black athletes are held up as role models and that sort of thing. One of the things in your book, you said that uh, blacks were kicked out at a higher rate than, than white students. So I kind of have a statistics background, so so give us some of the statistics about that that, that kind of support that idea. Yeah, well, well, the accounts the accounts of high terminations were to, were um, looked at based on uh, public media accounts with uh, public out media outlets and their stories that they covered, police record reports, court records. So went back and tried it for over a twenty year period to find all of that data to verify the findings, and so when I looked at my data that I found uh, for, for that time period based upon the athletes that were kicked out, uh, the two matched. I mean, you know, so it was just a simple tally. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a whole lot of fancy mathematics. It was just a simple tally. You look at the look at what you have, look at what you, you have, and you, okay, they overlay, they overlay. So, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, you know, tally can be as scientific as, as, as anything. So, um, I mean, these are not this is not fake news or alternative truth. This is this is what this is the, this, the information that's contained in the book is based on public record. So I tried to find and verify all the, all of the uh, uh, the data. And if I couldn't verify it in the literature, I would actually interview the athlete to get okay. their particular side of it. So, I, so it, it was a mixed methods book, if you will. But it's more <laughs> of a simple tally. Yeah. So let's talk about what percent of, of students are. I don't know if we should go with just black or, or all, all racial minorities, if you want to lump those together, um, compared to white students at BYU. As of the fall of 2013, BYU reported 4,139 students of color on campus. Underrepresented minority students as a whole just made up 14% of the student body. Most of them were Asian Pacific Islanders. Okay, that shouldn't surprise anybody. That's why we see, that's why, that's why BYU made the decision to go with the coach that they have now. 
because they are catering to this pot, which they should. The Kalani Shiitake yeah. you're talking about. This is, they, they should. This is, that's a, that was a great decision. So I would celebrate that decision. Um, and I, and I, think, I think they'll have a better result because of the coach that they have. So I hope this coach is not a puppet, though. This coach has his, has, has his own mind. He can think, but that's a good decision. So I, I celebrate that decision. So let me just mention one thing. So there's a, a current BYU coach. Um, I'll, I'll keep this a little bit vague, but I'm sure if you're a sports fan, you can figure out who I'm talking about. Yeah. But he used to coach at the University of Utah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had a conversation with him, and uh, I remember specifically he pointed at a, at a black athlete and he said, you know, we really recruited that athlete well. We brought the parents out and let them see the campus. He said, when I was at the University of Utah, mm -hmm. it was much easier to recruit black athletes at Utah than it is at BYU. Um, and I, I, was, I was surprised, number one, that he was so open about that, but number two, he just talked about how much harder it is to recruit the black athlete at BYU. Yeah, and why, why, why do you think that is? Well, I think, I mean, as, as I say in the, in the book, Rick, I mean, it's the culture of Provo. It's just Provo, it's the bubble, it's the consciousness of Mormons in this community, it's the lack of knowing, lack of knowledge of black people, even still, even in 2017. Um, uh, it's the... Um, it's the isolation here, the sense of isolation. You have to really, to fit in here, you have to have a, th you, if, if you're non-Mormon and you're black and you're Mormon, fitting in is another story in and all the, in the, of itself. But if you're not black and non-Mormon, it's, it's, it's very hard here. I mean, there's nothing to do here, really. Um, there's no, you know, things for young people to do other than, you think, well, this is a college campus. Well, yeah, but in terms of in the community itself, there's nothing really, everything revolves around BYU. So either you participate in BYU or you don't. And most football players hang together. They hang together because they're, they can, you know, they're, is they're isolated. The, the, the football, the, def the athletic department, just the nature of the athletic department isolates student athletes. It is isolated. And you can really see that with, with BYU. Um, and again, other schools, you have the same complaint with students of color who go to predominantly white schools. This is a phenomenon that's across, you know, across P PWIs, not just BYU, but it's across campuses, uh, you know, predominantly white campuses. It's hard, man, very hard. And students don't do well, you know, because they're, they're dealing with, you know, remember, these are young people who are coming from communities that none of us have any, well, I do, most white people have no clue about the difficulties of living in urban America, right? They have no idea. And you're traumatized, man. There's traumas there. So, um, but at any rate, so I'm speaking mostly about young men of color, uh, young African-American men of color, um, and what they go through. So yeah, crisis management should be available, um, which is why I find the BYU situation so incredulous, man. When they have the means, they have, they have, they know what they're supposed to do. At least rhetorically they know. So you're saying they should be more pastoral absolutely, in their, in their Absolutely, attention. and I, and I argued that in, in, the, in, my, in the last chapter. Here's an opportunity to really, really change, and they've done that by they, they've done it through osmosis. And I say that in the sense I'm not saying that young men have to convert to Mormonism, but there have been some young men who have converted to Mormonism since they they were here. I can think of a handful. Ty Detmer. Ty Detmer. Um, I'm thinking um, Kalen Hall. I'm thinking black players in particular. Um, who else? Jamal Willis and Wilson or Wilson Willis. Name? Willis. Him. Um, there are several of them, and. and and when I look at them and look at where, where they are, they're doing extremely well, man. You know, so I don't know if that's the church or if it's the chicken or the egg or, but they do great. So why not, why not harness that same energy mm -hmm. with non-Mormon players? Right. No, I, mean, I, I think that's you great. Know, and another thing, here's, here, and this, BYU, if you're listening to me, please hear me on this one. You have the Marriott School of Business here, one of the best business schools in the country. Why not have a career day for these athletes? The ones that you know may not finish their degree. Maybe you get them taught or, or may not go to the league. Is what, may not go to the league. They need a job. Why not use your resources at the Marriott School to imbue these young men with a, a, a potential job? I mean, the church is well-connected business in terms of its business connections. So much more can be done for these young men who need that kind of help. And this is not, all, this is not also a slam on the church. I want to be clear about that too. This is not, a, I'm, I'm not hating on the church. I want to make sure that people know that 
Um, this is a scholarly exercise for me. I, just, I happen to be a member of the church. This is very interesting to me to want to know, you know, how we treat other people who are not of our faith, who are not the same religion, who, who are not the same race, uh, and have the same background, class-oriented background, because most of these young men come from urban America. They come from inner city communities where most of them, uh, um, at least the ones that I, I interviewed for the, this particular book and then the, the article that Luke and I did, come from broken homes. Very few of, very few, uh, of these men had um, um, fathers in, the, in, their, in, their, in their midst or they had mothers who were working very hard to, to make sure they had an opportunity. And so they were, you know, like most parents, most black parents uh, in, uh, in, in any across the country who want their children to have a better opportunity than they had, if they have skills that they can uh, harness for that, such as their athletic ability, then, and then BYU has a good reputation as being a, 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 you know, a Christian institution, why not go there? You know, so, and the young men, you know, when they come here, uh, you know, in, to, to, to BYU's credit, I think they, um, you know, people here are nice, man. I mean, I, I'm in Utah, um, you know, the viewers, if you not, don't realize that, I think Rick mentioned we're in Orem, so I'm in, we're in Utah, but people here are nice. I mean, when I lived here for many years, I mean, one of the things I can say is that, you know, uh, you know, Utah is a, you know, you'll find some of the nicest racists, you, you know, you'll f ever see in the country right here in, in, in Utah. Very nice people who don't, um, you know, who don't, at least when I was here, never came up to me or called me out my name or, you know, made me feel, you know, less than here. Uh, and I think it's just the isolation of being black in a white environment where there's very little cultural things that you like, people who... Uh, look like you vibe like you have the same sort of ideas and about life and world the world as you do so that was so, sort of my um, one of the reasons why I left but I hope you enjoyed our discussion with Dr. Darren Smith our next conversation is one of my favorites we'll, we'll talk about BYU's attempts to get into the Big 12 conference it's a much better conference and BYU will make a lot more money if they can get into the conference however some schools such as Iowa State are opposed to BYU joining the Big 12 due to its stance on gays. It's not the first time BYU has been the subject of protests. Is it, does it seem hypocritical of Stanford accusing BYU very, of racism? Very <laughs> hypocritical, very hypocritical. But it goes to show you um, uh, where, where, where our level of thinking around these issues of race and indifference were during that time frame. The focus was on African Americans. Right, that was the focus. Uh, pull the beam out of your own eye before you, you know, turn the gaze on, uh, on others. Click here to subscribe. Click here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.